Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. Today we're going to talk about how to be silent, how to remain silent. It's a topic that comes up from time to time because we often talk about interaction with the police. I've talked about driver's licenses and driving infractions and what to do at the roadside if you get pulled over by a police officer. And there's a lot of debate about what you should say to a police officer or if in fact you should simply remain silent. And a lot of people have told me that, you know, hey Steve, the Fifth Amendment says I can refuse to speak to a police officer if I want to. And yeah, you can. But we'll, we'll talk about the nuances of that, but especially because there's actually one area of this that a lot of people are confused by, and that is the idea that if you simply remain silent, uh, you have not actually invoked your right against self-incrimination the way you might think you have because of a Supreme Court case. So the main thing we're talking about, though, in this context is what happens when you're pulled over by a police officer, what you need to do or what you don't need to do. Uh, and we'll get to that after we discuss the current state of the law with respect to the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And this comes to us from a, a Supreme Court case uh, that was handed down in 2010. So this is actually old law <laughs> by Supreme Court standards. But a case out of Michigan, believe it or not, made it to SCOTUS. Uh, and I might be mispronouncing the one uh, party's name, but it's Burgess versus Tompkins. And um, Tompkins was a criminal defendant in a case uh, charged with and convicted of murder. So we're going to talk about this. Uh, on January 10th, 2000, uh, a shooting occurred outside a mall in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, among the victims was Samuel Morris, who died from multiple gunshot wounds. Tompkins was a suspect and fled. About a year later, he was found in Ohio and arrested there. Um, Ohio is the state next to Michigan, if you head south. If you want to flee, you might want to go farther, but that's just me. Two Southfield police officers traveled to Ohio to interrogate Tompkins, uh, and the interrogation began around 1.30 p.m. one day and lasted about three hours. The interrogation was conducted in a room that was 8 feet by 10 feet, and Tompkins sat in a chair that resembled a school desk. That is, it had an arm that you could uh, you know, lean on or write onto. Uh, and at the beginning of the interrogation, one of the officers presented Tompkins with a form that contained the Miranda rights on it. It stated, notification of constitutional rights and statement. One, you have the right to remain silent. Two, anything you say can or will be used against you in a court of law. Three, you have the right to a lawyer. Uh, talk to a lawyer before answering. Any questions, and you have the right to have a lawyer present with you while you are answering any questions. Four, if you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning if you wish one. And five, this is the biggie, you have the right to decide at any time before or during questioning to use your right to remain silent and your right to talk with a lawyer while you're being questioned. Okay? So the uh, detective asked Tompkins to read that last one out loud, which he did. Uh, and then the, the officers then read the other four Miranda warnings out loud and asked Tompkins to sign the form to demonstrate that he understood his rights. Tompkins de declined to sign the form. Okay? Officers began an interrogation at one point uh, excuse me, at no point during the interrogation did Tompkins say that he wanted to remain silent uh, or that he did not want to talk with the police or that he wanted an attorney. Tompkins was largely silent during the interrogation, which lasted about three hours, uh, but he did give some verbal responses, uh, such as, yeah, no, or I don't know. On occasion, he communicated by nodding his head. At, at uh, uh, one point, um, he mentioned that he did not want a peppermint, which was offered to him, and at another point, he mentioned that the chair he was sitting on was hard. Now, this last two pieces of inf information is the kind of stuff you need to pay attention to. Because you'll notice that you'd never think a guy offering you a peppermint would be discussed by the U.S. Supreme Court. But it is being discussed by the U.S. Supreme Court because, among other things, it shows that the man's not being silent. If you have the right to remain silent, you don't say, I don't want a peppermint. Nor do you say, boy, this chair I'm sitting on is hard. <laughs> These pretzels are making me thirsty, okay? If you want to be silent, and I've mentioned this before, silence is zero. You don't say anything, okay? About two hours and 45 minutes into the interrogation, Helgert asked Tompkins, Helgert's the detective, do you believe in God? Tompkins made eye contact with Helgert and said yes. As his eyes welled up with tears, Helgert asked, do you pray to God? Tompkins said yes. Helgert then asked, do you pray to God to forgive you for shooting that boy down? To which Tompkins answered yes and looked away. Tompkins refused to make a written confession and the interrogation ended about 15 minutes later. 
But of course, saying that he did shoot the man indicates that uh, he's admitting he did it. So he's charged with first degree murder and put on trial and found guilty, and uh, on guilty, uh, 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 guilty on all counts, sentenced to life in prison without parole. That's what you get in Michigan. There's no death sentence here. You get life in prison without parole. So here's the thing. The man was told, you have the right to remain silent. And he sat there and didn't say, okay, I want to remain silent. He's also told, you have the right to have an attorney present with you during questioning. He didn't ask for an attorney. He just sat there. So they started asking him questions, and occasionally he gives them answers. And many people have pointed to this case and said, well, yeah, but the guy, you know, he's being grilled for two hours and 45 minutes. Of course he's going to give answers because they're wearing him down. But the point is, at the very beginning, when they read him his rights and said, you have the right to remain silent, he could have said, I choose to invoke that right, and then shut up. And they couldn't interrogate him beyond that, because that's what that right means. But he never said that. He just simply sat there, and to make his situation even worse, he said things. One of the things that I'd like to point out to you is that if you have the right to remain silent, and you want to invoke it, you can actually say, I invoke my right to remain silent. Or you can actually remain silent. If you want to, that's the hard way of doing it, but if you want to, you can say, and just look at him for three hours. I suspect after about an hour, hour and a half, he'll give up. But, you know, at that point, it's a staring contest. But the point is that, that he was answering their questions. And so the argument is, if he didn't want them to think that he was willing to speak to them, he should have said something. And what he should have said is, I'd like to invoke my right to not speak to you. And then they would stop. So uh, the Supreme Court in this case, Tompkins, points out that the Miranda Court, you've heard of the Miranda warnings, that's what we talked about earlier. The Miranda Court formulated the warning, and a suspect in custody must be advised as follows. He must be warned prior to any questioning that he has the right to remain silent, that anything he says can be used against him in a court of law, that he has the right to the presence of an attorney, and that if he cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for him prior to any questioning, if he so desires. So if a suspect is in custody, that's what they must be told. So Tompkins, after being convicted, decided to file an appeal, and the appeal went through the whole system all the way up to the Supreme Court. And his first argument was that he had invoked his privilege to remain silent by not saying anything for a sufficient period of time. So the interrogation should have ceased before he confessed. Um, the Supreme Court doesn't buy it, and, and I don't either, because this argument, as they say, is unpersuasive in the context of invoking the Miranda right to counsel. The court held that a suspect must do so unambiguously. I want an attorney. Okay? If an accused makes a statement concerning the right to counsel that is ambiguous or equivocal, or makes no statement, the police are not required to end the interrogation, assuming the person wants one. If they want one, they should ask. So they basically are saying, look, this right is like that right, meaning that your right against self-incrimination is the same as your right to an attorney. You want one, ask. You want to invoke your right against self-incrimination? Say so. Say so. So Tompkins did not say that he wanted to remain silent or that he did not want to talk with the police. Had he made either of these simple, unambiguous statements, he would have invoked his right to cut off questioning. Okay? So here he did neither, so he did not invoke his right to remain silent. Now, the Supreme Court points out that Tompkins made two slightly different arguments on this. And it's, it's such fine hair splitting that, uh, yeah, but, you know, this stuff happens at the Supreme Court level. We next consider whether Tompkins waived his right to remain silent, which is different than failing to invoke it, I guess. Uh, even absent the accused's invocation of the right to remain silent, the accused statement during a custodial interrogation is inadmissible at trial unless the prosecution can establish that the accused, in fact, knowingly and voluntarily waived it. And so the main purpose of Miranda is to ensure that an accused is advised of and understands the right to remain silent and the right to counsel. So if he knows those things and doesn't invoke them, the question is, does he also waive them? And um, an implicit waiver of the right to remain silent is sufficient to admit a suspect's statement into evidence. And so they're basically saying, look, if you look at these circumstances, it's obvious the guy knew what rights he had. He chose not to invoke them. Um, if the state establishes that a Miranda warning was given 
and the accused made an uncoerced statement. This showing standing alone is insufficient to demonstrate a valid waiver. Um, the prosecution must make the additional showing that the accused understood these rights. Where the prosecution shows that a Miranda warning was given and that it was understood by the accused, an accused's uncoerced statement establishes an implied waiver of the right to remain silent. So as a general proposition, the law can presume that an individual who, with a full understanding of his or her rights, acts in a manner inconsistent with their exercise, has made a deliberate choice to relinquish the protection those rights afford. And so they go on and on about how it's very, very obvious that the guy was answering questions, as trivial as they might have been, and he was not seeking to enforce you know, his right to remain silent because he never raised it, he never said it. And at the very beginning, when you read these things out loud, you'd think, well, he, you just read that to us. You must know you've got these rights. So he waived it and continued talking to them. The obvious, simple solution here is, if you wanted to remain silent, do one of two things. One, he could have said, I wish to remain silent. Therefore, I'm invoking my rights. I'm done here. And stop. Or he could have gone with the Steve Leto nuclear option, which is where you literally... When they ask you, do you want to remain silent? Remain silent. Uh, now, the problem is, if you do it that way, they might sit there and grill you for four, five, six, seven, eight hours if they want to, and you just sit there. Like I said, it becomes a staring contest where you stare and you just look at them. Um, I would advise you just to invoke your rights in the first place. But common sense or logic would simply dictate that what I'm talking about also, where I joke about it earlier, is if you want to invoke your right to remain silent, <laughs> especially at the roadside, yelling at the police officer about your right to remain silent and repeating it over and over and over again kind of defeats the purpose because you ain't remaining silent. So let's get back to the stop at the roadside. And, and here's the big question. You're driving down the road one day and a light's going behind you. You pull over. A police officer pulls up behind you in a police car, walks up in full dress. You know it's a police officer. There's no question about that. And you crack your window this far because you've been watching some really stupid videos on YouTube. And the police officer leans over and goes, I'd like to see your driver's license and registration, please. And um, proof of insurance. And uh, at least that's what they asked for in Michigan. And I've seen people who say, no, no, I don't have to give you anything. My Fifth Amendment rights. Boom. Well, the first question, of course, is are you in custody? Are you in custody? And most states would say that you're actually not in custody at that point because it's simply a, a... at that point, a traffic stop, and a traffic stop can be conducted to investigate something. And they say, wow, what if, what if I ask, am I free to go? Am I free to go? Does that mean I'm under arrest? No. It just means, it, it means you're being detained while a police officers are investigating something. But, be that as it may, let's talk about what the rights of the police are. Because the police officers have some reason for pulling people over, and they've got the right to do that. So the idea that every time you're pulled over by police officers is a violation under color of law is nonsense, okay? So I'm going to give you the examples from Michigan, and I'll let you know that these laws have parallels in all 50 states. All 50 states require you to have a driver's license if you're operating a motor vehicle on a public roadway. So in Michigan, when you're driving down the road, a police officer pulls you over just to let you know that the absolute first thing that a police officer has a right to ask you is, do you have a driver's license on you, Okay. Because there's a law that says you have to. MCL 257.311, possession of operator's license. The licensee shall have his or her operator's license in his or her immediate possession at all times when operating a motor vehicle and shall display the same upon demand of any police officer. So a police officer pulls you over and you're driving a motor vehicle on the public roadways and says, I want to see your driver's license. The law says you have to display it to them. Now, you might say, Steve, that's tricky. It doesn't seem to hand it to them. You've got to display it to them. So theoretically, theoretically, you could hold the driver's license up and say, there you go. See? And if the officer can clearly see that the front makes the driver's license look valid and you show him the back to indicate there's no changes on the back, a police officer would have a hard time charging you with that because the law says you must display it doesn't seem to hand it over however you should be know you should be you should you should be told that there have been instances in michigan where a person refused to put the driver's license in the hands of the police officer and the police officer said i can't see that i I literally can't see what you're showing me either your windows are tinted or the driver's license been mangled or something i would like to have it in my hand and the person said no 
And the police officer then arrested the person for failure to display because what they were doing was not allowing them to see what they needed to see to confirm that you weren't breaking this law. So MCL 257.311 says you must have a driver's license and you must display it on demand by a police officer. It doesn't say they have to display it on demand with probable cause. It just says they have to display it. So what you should know is that not having a license on you if in fact you don't have one, is a misdemeanor, okay? It's, a, it's an actual crime. We're not talking civil infractions here. It's a crime. Any person not exempt from licensing under this act who shall operate a motor vehicle upon the highways of this state and who is unable to show that he or she has been issued a license uh, shall be punished by imprisonment for not more than 90 days or by a fine of not less than five, uh, $50 and not more than 100 or both. And then it goes up on a second conviction. So driving without a license... Uh, is actually a misdemeanor. So a police officer pulls you over and says, display your license, and you sit there and decide, I'm going to invoke my Fifth Amendment rights. Like I said, the question is whether you have the right to do that or not. I don't know, because I've, I've seen arguments on that both ways. The ironic thing is, if you have a driver's license, and displaying it isn't actually testifying against yourself, which is what the Fifth Amendment actually talks about, uh, or self-incrimination. But the point is that if you want to do that, obviously they're not going to pull a gun out and shoot you to take your license from you. Uh, the point is that if they ask you for the driver's license, you show it to them. If you don't show it to them, well, guess what? You're just, you're now guilty of a misdemeanor. I should let you know that the law actually says that if you get pulled over for this and you cannot display the license or you refuse to pay to display the license, the law says that you can then take your driver's license into the, uh, the, the, the courthouse as long as you do it before the appearance date. And if you can show that you actually had one, you just didn't have it on you at that time, but you actually had one, they will waive uh, the bulk of the, of, the, of the charges against you, okay? Uh, in fact, they might waive the whole thing if, it's, if you can prove that you had a valid license at the time. So the point is that if you want to play the game, go right ahead. Police officer walks up, knocks on the window, driver's license registration. You sit there, not going to talk to him because it's the Fifth Amendment, right? And the police officer goes, well, I, want, I need to see your driver's license. And you just sit there, and he's okay. Walks back to his car, writes you up for failure to display driver's license, walks over, slides it in your window, and says, see you in court. Now, you can, if you want to, you can go to court and show your driver's license. But why are you going to show it to them later when you could just show it to the cop at the roadside? Um, so it just seems kind of silly to me. But hey, you can live your life the way you want to. If that's what you believe. But the other things they're going to ask you for at the roadside, again, are things they're allowed to ask of you. So the other thing they're allowed to ask for is registration and insurance. Now, I've had people say, Steve, when a police officer pulls up behind me, he can read my license plate. Why can the police officer not simply run my license plate and see whether or not it's a valid license plate that matches that car. I don't know. I don't care. There's a law that says it doesn't matter. A registration certificate shall at all times be carried in the vehicle to which it refers or shall be carried by or electronically accessible to the person driving or in control of the vehicle who shall display a paper copy or the electronic copy upon demand of a police officer. Everything else I just told you still applies. And likewise, insurance, the owner of a motor vehicle operates a permit, the operation of the motor vehicle upon the highways of the state or the operator of the motor vehicle itself shall produce under subsection 2, upon the request of a police officer, evidence that the motor vehicle is insured. So again, if a police officer pulls you over and asks you for those things, if you want to, you can sit there quietly, not answer the questions, and get a raft of tickets. And some of those are waivable, and some of them are not, and even the ones that are waivable might have costs associated with them. So what is it gaining you by not handing that stuff over if you have it? And you say, well, I'm doing this on principle. Well, you know, go right ahead. But it's a, it's a waste of everyone's time, including yours. But like I said, if you want to waste your time that way, knock yourself out. But how do you remain silent? Number one, actually remain silent. But number two, invoke your right to remain silent if you've been Mirandized. And that'll actually solve many of your problems that you could run into down the road. Questions or comments, always shoot them away. Otherwise, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.